audience, I'd like to let you know that you are um, encouraged and welcome to ask questions of each student presenter. The format is to do that through the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen, which means it will come via text, but I will read that out loud um, at the end of each student's presentation and we'll devote a few minutes to, um, to Q&A. So please, um, please feel free to do that. Um, I'd also like to let you know that we are recording this evening so that these presentations can be archived with the Carroll College Library Institutional Repository. So I think, um, I think that's all. I would like to, again, say thank you to our attendees for coming. And I, again, see that Dr. Christian has joined us. So thank you, Dr. Christian, and all of our students and guests. So without further ado, let's turn it over to our first presenter. This would be Sean Conroe. Thank you, Dr. Dolan. So good evening. I'm Sean Conroe here to present my research from our sociology senior seminar here at Carroll College. It is titled Disabled Proletariat and Ableist Bourgeoisie. I would like to begin with a little background. The United States has progressed as a nation, passing landmark legislation for civil and human rights over the past century. Despite momentous bills, shortfalls exist. There seems to be a constant dialogue in our nation that often sees different groups in civil conflict. Of interest to me is this dialogue as it concerns Americans with disabilities. Does Karl Marx's dialectic exist for us? The impetus for this research was the Americans with Disabilities Act. It was signed into law on 26 July, 1990. It was a logical procession from earlier work such as section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act and the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, important legislation in their own right. The emphasis of all of them was increased and just access, recognition and legitimacy without discrimination. The history of Americans with disabilities is one of resilience and dependency. Researchers have found significant economic disparities between those with disabilities and those without. This same group of Americans are also not allowed to compete in the labor market that drives our economy. Both of these things have led to a situation where people with disabilities experience four times the rate of unemployment of the rest of the nation and are forced into lives where the federal government often dictates what they can have and what they will be allowed to achieve. So in this, we see an example of Marxist social conflict theory, a proposition that people in a society interact through conflict and not to reach a consensus. Um, Karl Marx pictured here. Uh, we have an underclass of disenfranchised laborers, laborers, the proletariat, fighting those that control the means of production, the bourgeoisie. I began to view the struggle of Americans with disabilities as a disabled proletariat fighting with an ableist bourgeoisie that sought to maintain their position of privilege and power. Having observed that the, di the disabled form an underclass, I wanted to ask, is the dialectic between the disabled proletariat, DP, and the ableist bourgeoisie, AB, going on on the national level? This is the exact question my research sought to answer. So I conducted a content analysis across the archives of the New York Times, covering the last five years of our nation with the American with Disabilities Act. I used the search term disability disabled to search for recent political action that might suggest an active dialectic. I created a series of breakpoints to determine uh, the extent of the dialectic based on a yearly proportion of political actions, roughly breaking down to about one per month being a lively um, dialectic. The results were informative. I coded for 146 cases across five different variables. The first two were simple yes, no questions covering the involvement of the, the disabled proletariat and whether there was political action. The third variable coded into the articles, coded the articles into 15 separate categories ranging from proposed legislation to imprisonment or detention. The first two variables, or sorry, the final two variables determined who started the political action and if there was a direct response. On this slide here, you can see the first 15 cases coded in reverse chronological order. The full coded results have been preserved in Google Sheets if anybody is interested in going through them. I can very certainly also provide a copy to anybody that's interested. 
of these 146 cases, only three were thrown out. The other 143 cases overwhelmingly involved the disabled proletariat with a broad representation across different types of political action. Proposed legislation was the most common at 11.6% of cases. The 25.3% of inapplicable cases aligned with the number of cases that either didn't involve the DP or only did so indirectly. The wide variety of political actions saw three distinct epochs. Then presidential candidate Donald Trump's mocking of a reporter with disabilities, the death sentence of Bobby J. Moore, a man perhaps wrongly sentenced due to an intellectual disability, and years of arguments over President Trump's federal budgets. My personal favorite, if I had to choose one from the cases, was the solitary one that involved terrorist activity. It was, an, it was case 139, an article about disabilities that resulted from the San Bernardino shooting. It was a tragic event that broke the mold of many of the other cases where the ableist bourgeoisie initiated the action and the, the disabled proletariat responded. It also bumped up the political action variable from 14 to 15 possible codings, which was, I guess, fun in its own way. Um, with all of these cases, the dialectic was determined to be lively, but uneven. On these graphs, the yellow represents the ableist bourgeoisie. It can be seen that the ableist bourgeoisie were the initiators most of the time, and that most of that time, they were also the responders, the most as a, the largest share, not as a full proportion. This suggests that much of the political action for the disabled proletariat was started and handled by the ableist bourgeoisie, confirming my idea of reliance mentioned earlier. The research was successful, but there are many ways forward for, for it. The methods could certainly be expanded, which is what I expect to do next semester as part of my senior thesis. The scope could also be expanded, reaching across national borders and models of disability. The time frame could similarly be expanded, which is an included part of the senior thesis I plan on conducting. I would really like to, to very specifically track the trends across all 30 years of, the, of our nation with the American with Disabilities Act. To conclude then, our country has what I've called the disabled proletariat, and it forms a poorly appreciated underclass. Despite, and perhaps because of this, there exists a lively dialectic between the disabled proletariat and an oppressive ableist bourgeoisie. Having now conducted research, I am confident that the situation could use further analysis. If you would like to know more, I am available for questions here um, on Discord at doc6835 or by email at sconro at carol.edu. Thank you all for your time. Thank you so much, Sean. Are there any questions for Sean from the audience or from other panelists? Okay, this is a, such an odd format. I'm, so there may be someone just dying to ask a question and cannot figure out how to do it. So just a reminder on your screen, if you go down to the Q&A function, you can type in a question there and I will read it out loud. If there's a question directed for Sean and his research, we can also address it at the end of the evening. So um, thank you very much, Sean. I'm really looking forward to working with you on your honors thesis for the continuation of this project next semester. So everyone can stay tuned for um, Sean's second presentation of the, the further development of this research in the spring. So our next presenter is uh, Nathan Downey. Nathan, take it away. Thank you, Professor Dolan. Uh, let me go ahead and share my screen. Okie dokie. So for the purposes of my research, I decided to study the effects of COVID-19 isolation on interpersonal relationships. More specifically, the research question I evaluated was how has the lack of in-person social interaction as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic affected interpersonal relationships? This question derived from the sort of anime breaking down of social norms that appeared to have occurred as a result of the shift to online learning, working, and dating, with more, <clears throat> with more people staying at home 
During the COVID-19 pandemic, normal social ties appear to be breaking down and people are becoming accustomed to novel social norms, like having to only wear clothes on the upper half of their body for work or waking up one minute before class to zoom in from one's bedroom. With such a recent shift in social relations and norms, it is clear that there is a great need for further research on the various aspects of, social, of the social effects of COVID-19, especially its effects on interpersonal relationships. So in my literature review, articles pertaining to interpersonal relationships and COVID-19 were sorted into three main categories with various subcategories being applied where appropriate. In the family relationships category, most studies evaluated how the transition to sheltering in place and staying at home for extended periods of time has led to increases in domestic violence within the household. In the work relationships category, articles evaluated for the counseling slash psychotherapy and medicine slash healthcare subcategories mostly evaluated how use of telehealth presents unwanted challenges such as insecure network connections, inaccessibility for individuals who do not have access to the appropriate technology and distractions in the patient's or therapist's environment. These articles also have focused on how to implement policies for breaking bad news to patients through telehealth, as well as how to design and implement education programs to help physicians better deliver bad news to patients in the most compassionate of ways. For the school relationship subcategory, articles mostly focused on whether or not the transfer to online schooling was beneficial to students. And for the other subcategory, articles primarily focused on how the lack of in-person social interaction caused by increased use of telework has impacted job performance and work outcomes. Finally, in the intimate relationships category, articles evaluated for the sexual and other subcategories mostly focused focused on how COVID-19 and the transition to shelter in place affected sexual activity of individuals and how, and how shelter in place orders along with social distancing have limited the ability for queer communities to engage in physical forms of social leisure activities. Though these articles evaluated aspects of interpersonal relationships during the COVID-19 pandemic, they did not specifically address how the lack of in-person social interaction as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic has affected family, work, and intimate interpersonal relationships. For this reason, it seemed clear that more research was necessary for further scientific understanding of, co of how COVID-19 has affected interpersonal relationships. Next, I feel that an overview of the theories used to drive my research would be beneficial. Arguably, the theory which is most close related to interpersonal relationships is that of social exchange theory. This theory focuses on how relationships are composed of both rewards and costs and how each individual in the relationship seeks to maximize their rewards while minimizing their costs. In the context of a marital relationship, the rewards within the relationship could be things such as emotional security and sexual fulfillment, whereas the cost could be things like poor communication or sacrificing one's own interests to please the interests of, of, of the other person in the relationship. However, if the rewards of the relationship fall below those of the costs, the relationship often dissolves. Another social theory that was used to drive my research was that of reactance theory. This theory emphasizes the need for a person to have agency and to be able to control one's own destiny. When restraints are put on some part of a person's life, they often become distressed and seek to reclaim their freedom. When people's personal freedoms are reduced, they experience reactance, which is an angry, disappointed feeling. There are often three main outcomes to reactance. First, the person experiencing reactance will want that which is forbidden to them even more, or it will seem more appealing to them. Second, people will often take steps to reassert their freedom, and third, people will often feel greater anger or act aggressively toward the person who has restricted their freedom. By applying social exchange theory and reactance theory to my research question, it is possible to better understand how COVID-19 has affected interpersonal relationships. So next I will discuss the research methods that I will be using to study my <clears throat> in my study as I am still in the process of conducting my research and collecting data. 
in order to assess how the lack of in-person social interaction as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic has affected interpersonal relationships. My study will utilize a randomly selected sample of 100 students from Carroll College's population. These students will then be asked to complete a 22 question survey that will assess how the lack of in-person social interaction as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic has affected their family, work, and intimate interpersonal relationships. For the measures portion of my study, I will be collecting data on the demographic variables of gender, age, current employment status, and sexual orientation. I will also be collecting data on family and work relationships through the use of two separate five item questionnaires constructed to assess change in family and work relationships respectively during the COVID-19 pandemic. These questions will focus on things such as change in frequency of conversation with parents and siblings, change in frequency of argument with parents and siblings, change in amount of time spent communicating in person with a coworker, and change in frequency of conflict with a colleague. To measure intimate relationships, I will use an eight item questionnaire that will be adapted from a previous study to assess change in intimate relationships during the COVID-19 pandemic. These eight questions will focus on things such as change in satis satisfaction with sex life, change in sexual activity, and change in sex seeking behavior during the COVID-19 pandemic. For my statistical analysis, data collected through the SurveyMonkey online questionnaire will be stored in a spreadsheet and analyzed statistically using SPSS software. Each question will be evaluated using this software and the percentage of participants reporting change in their family, work, and intimate life will then be recorded for categories of increasing, which would include answers of significantly increased or slightly increased, no change, and decreased, which would include answers of significantly decreased or slightly decreased. Though I am still collecting data and cannot say for sure what the outcomes of my study will be, I expect more than 50% of participants to select no change for most of the questions asked on the survey, with a small percentage experiencing increases or decreases with respect to each variable of interest. Overall, I expect this research to fill a large gap in the social scientific literature on how the lack of in-person social interaction as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic has affected interpersonal relationships. And I expect this research to open the door for future research in this area of study. With data gathered from this study, it could be possible to further focus public assistance programs on supporting the areas of a person's social life that are most, that are most deprived during times of a pandemic. Uh, therapies could also be further curtailed to better address the points of social, social deprivation brought about by social separation of individuals during a pandemic. This re research would also allow for further study of individual aspects of family, work, and intimate relationships, such as why spending too much time with a loved one could lead to heightened hostility, or how working from home could deprive individuals of a, the ability to feel fulfilled and accomplished. From here, this research could go in a multitude of directions from macro level public assistance program management to micro level individual therapeutic interventions. And that's it. Yes, thank you so much, Nathan. I, I hear the audience clapping for you somewhere. Um, are there any questions for Nathan that you'd like to bring up in the Q&A or any of the other panelists have a question for Nathan? Nathan, I might ask you, for those of you who don't know, Nathan is a um, double major in sociology and biology, which I think is such a great combination. Um, that doesn't necessarily make your research topic to me obvious. Um, could you tell us how you came to this particular topic? Um, well, first of all, I needed to actually start researching what I wanted to do. So um, I started looking into the research or the literature and seeing um, current things that are happening with COVID that I would be able to actually perform research here at Carroll on. Um, and yeah, I guess I, I, I started thinking about 
all the different things that I see, like people not wearing masks in stores or um, people not complying with CDC instruction and things like that. And so that's where I sort of started looking at reactants. And then um, interpersonal relationships just seemed like a good fit for most of the things I wanted to look at because the of all the changes with um, school and also with work and everything transferring online, it seemed like it would be a good area to look into for for trying to answer most of the questions I was looking at with only doing one survey. And you're getting in a lot in the survey. You've, you've created a very, um, very good um, instrument. So there are two questions for you um, specifically about your research. And one is, um, is the sample going to be college students? And if so, do you expect to see a lot of change? So yes, the sample is going to be 100, hopefully 100 uh, Carroll College students that are randomly selected. And um, what was the second part? If I expect to see a change. Yep. Um, so like I was saying before, I feel like to each question, there's a total of 22 questions and with four being demographics and 18 being um, questions that you can respond with significantly increased, significantly decreased, no change, significantly decreased or or significantly increased or slightly increased. And so um, with that, I expect most people to say there's no change on most of the questions, but what I would really be looking at is the remainder to see whether or not there's more increases or decreases within each variable that I'm looking at. So overall, I feel like most people don't have that much of a change, but more change than what there was, or there is a change still from pre-pandemic times to now. So I do expect to see things there. Super, thank you very much. All right, um, and if other questions come up for Nathan, you can ask them and we can address them at the end. So we will now turn it over to Logan Dutton. All right, all right, all right. So we'll just dive on into this. Okay, so um, thank you, Dr. Olin. My name is Logan Dutton. Um, I'm a senior here at Carroll, and this is my senior paper. So uh, what I looked at was stressors on law enforcement. Um, law enforcement is a hot topic in today's political climate, and I really wanted to look at some of the causes or stress and stressors into why law enforcement do the things they do. Um, my motivation behind this work, uh, I wanted to kind of change the social stigma uh, of law enforcement. Um, we kind of have this uh, unrealistic expectation on them um, being perfect, when in fact, uh, no one's perfect. Uh, they're just humans with a extraordinary amount of power. And that leads into my second second point on uh, the, these, these ordinary people are given uh, an extraordinary amount of power over uh, the average citizen. And I want those people to be at their peak, their pinnacle point, to be sharp as a, as a blade, uh, mentally wise. Um, and that uh, really, really motivated me on this on this topic. And then the next being firsthand experience. So I was, I was a reserve police officer with the home police department for uh, a little over three years until recently due to budget cuts, I was let go. Um, but this is also motivated by my experiences in that profession. Um, during my time, uh, I really observed three main stressors, uh, both on myself as well as my, uh, my previous fellow colleagues. And uh, so uh, the first one being command staff, administrative pressures. Uh, other people call this uh, like uh, occupational stress stressors or stuff like that. Uh, it's kind of all one and the same. And then the next being public pressure, uh, mainly from unrealistic expectations. Uh, we see this a lot in like officer involved shootings, other use of force instances, uh, just overall parts of the job. Um, I noticed that too. 
Uh, and then, of course, family pressures and complications. So uh, the divorce rate among law enforcement is significantly higher than the average population. Uh, you know, and then, of course, again, average people have uh, stressors on their lives. Uh, could be financial stress, um, could be stuff from significant other, so on and so forth. So that all affects the officer's work performance. So that leads into my research question that I was looking at is do administrative, public and family stressors negatively affect an officer's work performance? Um, and this is work on that. So a couple of the theories that really stuck out to me and I thought pertained to this topic were personal environment of fit theory, P fit for short. Um, so this is basically uh, like people, people mold themselves to the environment that's around them, or they, they conform to what, uh, what they're in. And then the second is general strain theory. If you're a sociologist, this is kind of the bread and butter, especially in the criminal, criminal realm, but in this pertaining to law enforcement of, uh, stressors, putting a, a strain on officers and making them do things that they normally wouldn't do. Uh, which in turn negatively affects the community and or other people around them. Um, so I looked, some of my methods, I looked at qualitative data. Um, I uh, had a couple hiccups along the way, but I made the best with what I could and really, really uh, dove in deep into what I could find. Um, there's a limited amount of data on this stuff just because it's not a super precedenting uh, social topic, but uh, I did the best with what I could. And I looked through academic journals, scholarly articles, um, so uh, works from sociologists and psychologists, not too much on the psychologists, but there's definitely some factors that uh, came into play. So I looked at those. Um, and then I looked at interviews from officers, documentaries, um, and then of course my own personal experiences, uh, and then word of mouth. So like my friends, uh, my other colleagues, retired friends that I have, um, I looked at those examples as well. Uh, my unit of analysis was patrol officers with the rank sergeant or lower in varying agencies throughout the US. Um, I targeted patrol because this is where a majority, a far majority of the public's inter interaction with law enforcement takes place. So there's calls all the time, and each one of those is an interaction between law enforcement and the public. So it seemed fitting to study that specific department or area because that's where a majority of the, the interaction comes from. And I looked at sergeant or lower because typically in agencies, uh, if you get above the rank of sergeant to lieutenant or captain or anything above that, uh, Typically, it's more administrative work. Uh, you're doing less interaction with the police. You're not on patrol, typically. So you're not going to call to call to call, uh, talking to people, interacting with those people. So that's why I looked at that. Um, so uh, some of the general results I found and some of the more uh, representative data was from Bush and Neely. Uh, in 2015 in their study, and then Kaplan in 2018 uh, in relation to stressors from administrative or institution, institutional stress, as they referred to it. Um, and they concluded that uh, there was negative effects on uh, law enforcement from administrative pressures. Um, in one of those studies, it was nice uh, to look at and see how they changed that. And uh, they kind of restructured uh, communication and they put admin out on patrol every now and then. So it really made the, the cohesion a little bit better and uh, overall more respect for both sides of the, of the pile on there. So uh, moving on, Hassan and Colin and Golowski both stated in their studies that unrealistic expectations set by the public were causing negative effects on law enforcement, resulting in burnout, PTSD, and of course, suicide. Um, a lot 
a lot of what I saw on this topic was mainly pertaining to mental health and how uh, the public didn't really see the need for law enforcement mental health, um, especially in regards to like sorting them into different sections in the general public of like, oh, they can, they can handle it on their own. You know, they don't need this. This is what they do and so on and so forth. Um, and then moving on to family, there wasn't a lot of uh, information on this, but again, I found some good information of what little I could. And uh, there it was, I was expecting kind of like one or the other. So it was kind of shocking to find out that it, it was shocking, but uh, it also wasn't uh, to find out that there was, it was kind of like this polarized uh, conclusion of like they were either the, the glue that holds the, the family together or they were the hole in the sinking ship, so to speak, um, causing them extreme uh, stress. So um, based on the results I found in research, I can conclude that administrative pressure negatively affects officer performance. Um, you know, not, not one study I found was like people would look forward to go to work and be yelled at by a commanding officer. So that kind of is a little, a little logical. So uh, then unrealistic sex set by the public uh, negatively affected the mental status, which resulted in negative performance. So this is also pretty, uh, I expected this as well, just because, I mean, it's, it's to the effect of you can never do anything right. So that's what I saw in my, my dad as well. Um, and then again, family influences uh, their performance as well. Kind of, again, polar opposite, uh, either the glue or the hole in the sinking ship. Uh, and that was, that was interesting to read. Um, so where I'd like to go with this in the future, uh, I'd like to get a little bit more statistical based data um, I'd, lo I'd love to get IRB approval and then give it a, a survey out to local law enforcement because I see that as being very beneficial, especially for me as well as most of you. Um, but I'd love to get statistics so I can run uh, a hypothesis test uh, and then make fun charts and graphs and make it seem a little bit more solid. Um, and then, of course, my overall goal is to fix this problem. Um, I would love to get the respect and, and the, the dignity that the law enforcement profession should deserve back. Uh, I feel like that is through focusing on their mental health um, and uh, getting them back to being on point, so to speak. So that's been my work. Thank you and stay warm. Thank you so much, Logan. Are there any questions from the audience? Jacob. Hey, Logan, great job, man. Um, only question I had was you, you were looking primarily at like uh, patrol officers. Would you expect these same results in like highway patrol or sheriff's office or even like with federal agents where uh, they have varying levels of uh, interaction with the public, do you think that that would still be, uh, the public interaction would still be a negative effect for them or do you think it would be more so, less so, about the same? Great question, um, thank you. I would say for Highway Patrol, Highway Patrol tend to not res respond to like calls like, uh, like your domestics, uh, your barking dog complaints, so on and so forth. So I would expect to see like less Less interaction, which would result in less negative performance per se. Uh, um, federal officers, possibly. I'm not too familiar with like exactly how they function, but uh, I would say, to an extent, the same. Maybe a little less because I, from what I've heard through uh, friends, that they they do a little bit more uh, office work, report writing, so on and so forth. So maybe maybe a little bit of in fluctuation, but who knows. Great question, Jake, and um, great response, Logan. I know that this is your um, career path, your intended career path. 
So I'm thrilled that this is a topic of interest to you because as we know, this is an enormously important um, issue and um, will need to be examined sociologically and addressed. And so I'm, I'm glad that it's um, of interest to you and I hope that you get a chance to further study this and work on this. Thank you. Later. All right, um, so thank you, Logan. Next up, we have Brittany Gamble. Thank you, sorry. I was just trying to make sure I could get that on the screen. Um, so as uh, Dr. Dolan's already said, I'm Brittany Campbell, and my presentation is called Addicted to Stigma. Um, I was looking at the use of stigmatized language and reporting substance users' death. So the first thing is, is I'm not a neuroscientist. As you can all tell, I have been introduced as a sociology student. But what I'm about to present may help. Um, first thing of all, there is a number of rising overdose deaths here in America. Um, and what this means is that there's always a larger availability for things like organ donations <clears throat> and brains for research. However, there are some problems with this. Due to inconsistencies in death certificates and reporting issues, we cannot really track these deaths. And this leads to obscure data as well as missed opportunities for research. So what I propose, I propose a set standard. This is why this research focuses on the stigmatization, stigmatization of substance users after death and the words that are used to label them. I hope to provide, or I hope to prove that there, by doing this research, we need a set of standards when it comes to reporting deaths and how this can help with future research and prevention of substance abuse. So my idea behind this was that individuals with substance use disorders are not only stigmatized during life, but also in death. Um, this is also an issue when it comes to reporting with issues with the continuation of approved stigma that is used to describe and handle these individuals. Gothman theorized looking at the idea of stigma and social identity. Um, he theorized that the idea of stigma was the situation that an individual finds that they're disqualified from social acceptance. My research looked at the pathway from loss to gains into social identity as a way into addiction. The pathway to addiction through identity loss is seen as the loss of family roles, work roles, and healthy relationships, as well as the loss of certain abilities. This social identities are spoiled due to the individual's use or loss of their identities can be catalyst for the addiction. This loss of identity is more normal and seen more often in addiction. I also looked at the pathway of gain of an identity. These individuals are reported as being socially isolated normally and lacking supportive ties or have unmet needs or social and individual level. Um, due to this, the gain of a new identity as a substance user inside of that social group is also a way into addiction. So what did my methods look at? I looked at the research. Um, so during my research, I looked at obituaries on legacy.com from 2017 to 2020. There was a set of keywords and during this, the search to narrow during this, the search to narrow down the results as well as to speed up the process. The set of keywords were also chosen looking at stigmatized versus non-stigmatized words. The set of keyword, keywords are as follows. So stigmatized, as you can see here on the display, as accidental, untimely, unexpectedly, or battle, or other. And then non-stigmatized is looking as addition, substance abuse, drug, or overdose. These searches were broken down between first find results for each obvious keyword. So those obvious keywords, as you can again see on the screen, are accidental addiction, drug overdose, and substance use. This resulted in 140 
140 cases that were then coded into an SPSS system using the variables state, word count, year, sex, age, stigma, non-stigma, word count, and word count, or word one and word two. Then taking this data, I looked at the amount of words that fit the criteria that occurred in the obituary. So that would be the word count variable, as well as that the words determining if they were stigmatized words versus non-stigmatized, depending on defining criteria as explained above, word one, word two variables. So here's another example that I wanted to show just so that people had more of an idea of what I was talking about when it was versus stigma versus non-stigma. As you can see, the one talks about how the um, individual had accidentally passed away after a two-year recovery, while as the other one actually talks about the battle that, oh, oh, I don't know what just happened. There we go. Okay, talks about the battle that he had with the opioid addiction and how this uh, disease had taken away um, so many different years of their life and how they had remembered him fondly. Um, so as you can see the difference between, between stigma versus non-stigma. Also at the bottom, as you can see, I added in something that I found really interesting during my research that just happened to go really well with what I I had on, I had an under, like just happened to go really well with what I was going with. Um, so this one was from a, a girl named who, Teresa who had passed away. Um, she talks about how she had told her mother, um, even if she were to relapse and pass away, she would want the truth to be told. Um, and that she would, she was tired of reading about people who were dying unexpectedly or suddenly, and that there should not be any more shame and it's just a disease. It's not something that we should look at as a moral failing. So these were what my findings were. So non-stigma versus stigma versus the percentage of sex. So this was just the percentage of sex. I have to further in my findings, I need to narrow this down more into a more readable variable. But um, as you can see for my deaths that I did report, I have a higher male ratio than female ratio. You can also see that I do have a higher non-stigma versus stigma for the words that are used. So that was one of the more interesting ones. Another thing that I found in my conclusion, as you can see for this bar as well, is the different years. So as you can see, the non-stigma related words for the first part of the years, the 2017, 2018, and 2019, were much higher versus the stigma related words that you see in 2020 that are now much higher. So what does this mean? This means that we need to find another, we need to find a set standards of words that we use when we report these deaths. The reason that is, is because for further research as well as to help in prevention of this addiction. It also would give us more of an insight into the disease and more of a possibility of being able to find more research and how to, again, like I said, prevent it. So that's it. Thank you, Brittany. Are there any questions from the audience for Brittany? Or the panel? Nathan, please. Have you done research like this previously or what, what made you want to choose this topic for your research paper? Um, I have done previous research into looking at addiction, but not something this extensive. Um, the reason I started looking at this topic was because it's kind of near and dear to my heart when it comes to the individuals that I deal with on a daily basis. Um, it also is kind of near and dear to my heart when it comes to family members that I do have that are currently suffering with this disease. So it was just something that I was looking at. Um, I had looking started looking at it last year um, just to look at for how I was going to start trying to operationalize it for this year. And that's when Dr. Dolan told me, well, how about you start looking maybe into obituaries? And as morbid as an idea that sounds, it actually gives you quite an insight into the way that we stigmatize individuals even after death. 
Thanks, Brittany. We actually have um, another question for you from Dr. Christian. Are you sure that um, many of the deaths called accidental or sudden are related to overdose and addiction? She actually, further, I'm sorry, just add that she's also wondered this as someone who reads obituaries. Okay, actually, I thought about that too while I was reading it, and it was something that I had to um, I had to operationalize as well, and I had to really look into them. Um, so it wasn't just something that I I looked at the um, face value of it because Legacy.com, if you look at it, will give you kind of a short uh, snippet. Um, but I actually went in and and ended up reading in depth um, all the obituaries that I did read. Um, and the ones that I found that only said things like accidentally or unexpectedly, if it didn't have some sort of connection eventually with addiction sort of in that also obituary, as I read down the way, it would start to describe things like their long battle with addiction or their recovery into addiction. And then it would also read that somehow they had relapsed and this was part of the reason for their passing. So that was also the reason that I, um, had to look further into them because I wasn't just going to take it accidentally or untimely um, just due to the fact that that would actually cause too much issues with the data. I think you could also say then that um, you're likely underestimating the number of obituaries that um, yes. are actually talking about addiction because you're really being very conservative. Yes, and um, also what would be interesting for further research, I did think about this after you had mentioned to me, Dr. Dolan, would be if I could actually get the factual like reports from the coroners, um, but that would be something that would, be, would take more time and I didn't have that time during this last semester. Okay, thank you so much, Brittany. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next we have David Pippinich. Thank you, Dr. Dolan. Just give me a minute to share my screen here. Okay, it feels like my computer is a little bit boggy, but everybody can see everything okay, I think. <clears throat> so my study is, uh, the study that I'm doing um, in this presentation is on the group effects of boredom proneness on anxiety and fear of missing out. And we're taking a sociological perspective because <clears throat> I feel like that has been uh, largely uh, missed in a lot of the studies. Uh, this is kind of um, converging psychology and sociology uh, largely. Um, but I wanted to take a very grand sociological perspective on this window of, uh, on, this, on this particular uh, view. So in introduction, um, we are rating individuals and I thought some definitions were in order. One of them is um, the boredom proneness scale, which um, in a good, good example from uh, some of the questions that, and it's, um, it's a shorter, like 28 question boredom prone scale. And it says, uh, one of the questions as an example is in any situation can um, you usually find something to do or see to keep me interested. And then the fear of missing out um, as a variable in there um, is a scale that we use. Again, multiple questions. And a good example is um, I get anxious when I don't know what my friends are up to. Um, and then of course we're rating anxiety, which is everything from heart pounding to fear of uh, losing control. And um, this has links to uh, social media use and so many different facets of life. So I think it's definitely worth studying and uh, talks and it refers to the, our ability to function in social gatherings as well. And um, largely there, I feel like there is a, the, what, what got me started on this study was I felt like there was a disjunction between a group or an and or individuals and the shared meetings that we place between shared tasks and 
So I thought it would be really interesting to create a study where we take away all the stimulus and say that there are no tasks, see how they feel and how a group can affect um, individuals in that way. So in terms of a little history, um, everybody kind of understands in some uh, way that technology that we're in a, a technological age and we live in a fast-paced culture and it doesn't appear to get, be getting any slower. Um, in some ways, I feel like the our, our proneness to boredom um, on a national scale is kind of like the elephant in the room that nobody really wants to talk about. Um, and this is an American ideology of our perspective on time and values, and especially once, once we start getting into um, symbolism uh, that we that we place individually um, and in groups, what we can gain from each other. And we're talking about distinctions between uh, class and boredom proneness on a national scale. And though I'm not, I didn't study class per se, um, that can kind of be derived from a lot of the statistics based on the population. Um, and I feel like there's more that could be done uh, as far as um, generalizing it out to larger populations. And we can talk about more of that as we get into future future directions. And so our, my question is, does group size affect um, and boredom proneness have significant effects on individual fear of missing out and anxiety? And I'm taking a symbolic interactionism stance on this one, um, taking a non-entertaining, pun intended, look at how uh, groups versus individuals handle periods of time without personal value added to it. Um, and this is a hint toward the need for uh, value in day-to-day -day interactions, uh, traits and symbols of boredom avoidance. So we're in the end, I think the, the most interesting way to think of this study is to understand how coping mechanisms are being utilized to help um, relieve uh, boredom and the implications that this, this could have on a societal, you know, on a societal scale. Uh, my hypothesis is that individuals will be less anxious in groups settings versus individual settings and individuals uh, will rate higher on the fear of missing out scale when alone versus in a group. And boredom proneness levels will mediate the interaction between these variables in a group setting. And I say this hypothesis in a very confident way, but um, as we've been going along with the study, um, we'll get into the, we're not gonna be able to get into data per se, because uh, we're still in the process of the study. I think I just, about 10 minutes ago, just um, uh, walked my last, um, my last participant through the study. So um, it'll be interesting to get results back on that. And I honestly, um, from a scientific perspective, I am I'm, uh, willing to be surprised um, from the effects of the research. So some of the literature uh, pertained was um, one article on the social differences in leisure boredom and its consequences for life satisfaction among young people outlined and I'm quoting it, uh, leisure boredom correlates positively with a weak social network and a lack of parental monitoring. And they also find that um, leisure boredom, even after taking into account many other characteristics of young people's social, economic, and cultural living environment, significantly, pre significantly predicts low life satisfaction. This kind of gets into like why the problem is the way that it is and why I feel like it needed to be studied. Um, the bottom one there is um, anxious, bored, and maybe missing out, out, evaluation of anxiety, attachment, boredom, proneness, and fear of missing out, really um, identify the links for me between fear of missing out and anxiety and boredom, and how those can go together, um, and using uh, like studies to go, that, to go that route. However, rather than taking a psychological study, I wanted to add the group effect uh, to that to see um, how individuals are affected by groups in that same way. And boredom in the USA experience sampling and boredom in everyday life really outlines the national uh, scale that boredom seems to be taking on um, and how we can see changes over time with, um, with those results. So for my study, I recruited, we're trying to recruit about 60 students. We'll see how many we got uh, from Carroll College, 18 years or over. We subjected them to boredom for seven and a half minutes. And based on studies that were done before, uh, that seemed to be a good amount of time to, um, to subject them to that. And we just take away all stimulus, uh, remove, and it was over Zoom, but we had them remove all the tabs from their computer, remove their phones, pencils, writing pencils, and try to isolate themselves as much as possible. 
um, in order to do this. The one, the nice thing about walking them through this in the Zoom way or um, using uh, social, uh, using media was that um, it gives us the opportunity to study this on a grand, grander scales um, and even internationally, which I think would be a really exciting uh, future studies to do. And giving, um, so I gave them post study questionnaires afterwards to rate levels of anxiety, um, the Beck anxiety inventory, the fear of missing out scale and the boredom prone scale. Then we asked one additional question at the very end, which was how bored were you? Um, the results are still to be determined and uh, graphs and data will follow from that very shortly. Conclusion of where we go from here, uh, understanding coping mechanisms used in group settings to cope with or reduce the risk for depression, anxiety, addiction, hostility, anger, poor social skills, bad grades, and low work performance. And I think that's just like a handful uh, as examples of things. Um, and when I talk about the, the elephant in the room that nobody really wants to talk about, I feel like this is kind of leading into so many different social aspects to life um, that we can that we can add that sociology can provide answers to. Um, and then additional questions, pressures to conform in a public setting based on values learned socially and culturally. We already know that there's been studies done on, say, the bystander effect. Um, and so we already know that just having a group, the presence of a group can have um, individual effects that um, that have consequences, um, even, even uh, long-term consequences. And what happens when we can't measure up with attention deficits? And how do we react to that when we know that there is the pressure to, um, to be less bored per se, um, if it was to be seen as a weakness or something like that? Um, future look, taking the study to international and cross-cultural levels, as was already mentioned. And, uh, that is all I have for that. I want to thank you very much for this opportunity and open it up for questions. Great. Thank you, David. I'm going to give it a little bit more time uh, for the audience to type in a question because apparently last time someone was typing and we moved, we moved forward. So um, if you have a question for David, please get that in. Does anyone from the panel have a question for David? David, do you, do you have any cross-cultural international comparison in mind? Do you know much? I don't know much about literature on boredom cross-culturally. Um, I remember some that I was looking at uh, and some literature that I was looking at years ago, which kind of um, fed my interest in this, which is that, uh, for instance, in Japan, it's, um, whereas we believe in, in uncomfortable silences, um, they tend to believe more in comfortable silences, and they actually look down on people that just blurt things out. And so there's a lot more emphasis on, in other cultures, um, a lot more emphasis on being able to uh, reflect before you talk, for instance, and to be able to fill that space in, in an accurate way. Um, so if you had to come to somebody's house in Japan, for instance, you would knock on their door and start screaming things. If, if it was something really important you wanted to say, you would get invited in for tea. You would make the tea. You would sit down and all this kind of um, plays into, hmm, there are definitely some cultural differences in how we, how we fill spaces in time and the value we place in between that. Um, even in our country, um, in the West, they, um, palavers were, very, were a very common thing. You can picture two guys uh, sitting on rocking chairs on a front porch. There wasn't a whole lot of uh, necessarily um, talking per se. You thought before you talked um, in that way, you know. And so we definitely see changes in time socially in that. And so I think it's worth studying. Yeah, very good. I agree. Thank you. Um, there is a question for you from the audience, and that is, did you get IRB approval? And if so, did they have concerns about the research? IRB approval was um, achieved. And in terms of, um, we were kind of worried about um, subjecting them to anxiety, but since um, a lot of what we're doing is not really related to anxiety per se, even though they're being rated on that. Um, the, uh, the directors were not too concerned about that. 
Um, and I, I have had a couple of, of concerns from participants who say, hey, you know, I have ADHD or things like that. And I think that kind of leads into more studies that can be done uh, based on attention deficits mm -hmm. and our ability um, to, to do these kinds of things. But it was approved across the board. All right, thank you so much, David. Did I cut someone else off? Okay, all right, well, thank you. Next up, we have Jacob Rash. All right, can everybody see me and see my presentation? All right, let me just get my stuff pulled up here real fast. Okay, awesome. My name is Jacob Rash, and today we're going to be talking about media dependency theory and how it relates to gun control. But first off, I'd like to ask you guys a question. What is truth? Truth can be defined as the factual representation of reality as it stands, free from bias or alteration. Truth is represented by accurate data, factual information, the understanding of the world and its order. Each individual has also their own idea of truth, which we call the perceived truth. This truth is altered by our own views of the world and the information that we have to reinforce our perspectives. In and of itself, this is not necessarily wrong. But what if those in power were able to manipulate your perceived truth to serve its own interest? What if your perceived truth is not based on reality or even our own perceptions, but merely the repeated statements of misinformation from the institutions that we trust? And that's where media dependency theory comes in. Media dependency theory claims that today's society is dependent on forms of the media for crucial information, and the media is dependent on individuals to promote their agenda. Media platforms have replaced many avenues of information gathering. They control our news, our entertainment, influence public policy, and even shape discourse and culture. According to Trabal in 2014, only six firms own over 70% of all media platforms and public forums for information and entertainment, which alter the public's perception of truth to push advertising campaigns towards their viewers. Media dependency theory also claims that this lack of informational source diversity leads to echo tunnels of narratives. The theory claims that, quote, people tend to be more influenced by the media when they have few other sources of information available to them, end quote. Media dependency theory assumes that the mass media has enough influence to influence citizens who have no prior experience with the topic, quote, belief becomes the default value, unquote. If you guys take a look at my slide, I have a graphic there for you. And this is the propaganda model that was proposed by Herman and Chomsky. And basically what this model uh, is trying to illustrate is that the information that we receive at any given point is goes through a series of filter before we receive the end product. In their discussion, they were talking about anti-communism rhetoric, but I believe the uh, propaganda model does a good job of not only illustrating what we're trying to talk about, uh, but also just show the various filters that our information goes through before we receive the final product. Herman and Chomsky argue that the information is presented in a way to not only push their view on the information, but also to elicit a response from their audience to keep them tuned in. This benefits them as they maintain ratings and their advertisers will continue to reach the largest audience. So well, what does that mean for our study? This study wishes to test this theory by seeing if the presentation of factual information that has been filtered out can be used to combat this process, particularly in areas where viewers may not have much prior knowledge. For that, I wanted to analyze one of the most debated topics in American politics, gun violence and the push to ban the AR-15 semi-automatic sporting carbine through the use of what they term moral panics. Invented as a civilian grade version of the M16 in 1968, this firearm is one of the most popularly owned by American citizens. This study wishes to provide some insight to see if media dependency theory has applicable roots in American political discourse by exposing participants to factual information based on trusted sources to see if this makes participants aware of their bias in media sources. If this research is able to discover a relationship, it can also provide evidence to dispel, uh, dispel misinformation campaigns in the media to provide alternative factual informational sources. So just for some information for context, 
With the recent media coverage of the large deadly mass shootings in recent years, the majority of Americans agree that safety measures should be in place and restrictions should apply for Second Amendment rights to reduce gun violence. However, there seems to exist a core dispute surrounding the ownership of AR-15 style rifles, which the media deems responsible for these issues. While mass shootings are tragic and horrific, how can the American public know the best course of action to prevent these incidents and also gun violence across the United States? What are the facts? In 2018, there was a total of 10,265 reported closed firearm related homicides of which 6,000 were due to handguns, just shy of 300 were due to rifles, 230 due to shotguns, 167 due to other firearms, according to the FBI's UCR report. In these results, Murders that involve the AR-15 style firearm are categorized under rifles, which include mass shooting events in that year. This figure appears rather low and not as significant as other categories in the report. In fact, it's lower than any other thing a firearm at all. The gun control narrative presented by some media outlets have been targeting these assault style rifles, even though the FBI's uniform crime report states that handguns are far more a threat to society and the murders involving rifles are even less significant than murders not involving a firearm. Why then is the media pushing for the ban of this particular weapon? In fact, AR-15s are responsible for less than 2% of annual firearm related deaths while being one of the most popular firearms owned in the United States. While mass shootings are horrific, they are not increasing at an alarming rate. Although they have become more deadly in the last past uh, last couple years, there is no relationship that seems to have been made between the AR-15s released in 1968 and the frequency of mass shootings. As the number of annual mass shootings are def as defined by the FBI have remained rather steady in the last 40 years. So how is this going to our study? The study consisted of an, uh, is going to consist of an anonymous survey of Carroll College students from a diverse background and firearm experience built to determine a dependency score, which reflects the participants dependence on the media for information on this topic. They will then watch a series of short videos portraying accurate sourced information about the history of guns in the United States, the legislation surrounding guns, gun violence statistics and common misconceptions in current discourse. The participants then received a second set of questions determining a reflection score, which which signifies the change in confidence to have informed discussion regarding the topic and expose misinformation campaigns that exist in the media. What the study then did was compare the dependency and reflection scores to see if there was a statistically significant relationship between the two variables, suggesting the presence of media dependency theory. Our hypothesis. What I believe is that those with a high dependency score, which signify a high dependence on the media for the information, and those with a high reflection score, will see that there's a relationship that takes place that's statistically significant, showing that there's at least some evidence to support that media dependency theory can be observed in modern discourse. So while I am still awaiting IRB approval for my research, what I will hope to find is a statistically significant relationship between the dependency on the media on unknown topics and their ability to cite factual information in their discourse. If we do find this relationship, we will have begun to open the doors and expose just how prevalent we rely on the media to form our own opinions. My hope is participants in the study will not only learn more about this topic and the facts behind the information, but also begin to question the validity of their sources that they use in discourse. Conclusion. The intent of this research was not to sway public opinion one way or another, but to see if sourced information will not only make participants aware of this misinformation in the media, but also provide participants with education to better understand the topic and test media dependency theory. If the results to the study support my hypothesis, I'll be able to support the idea that the presentation of factual information can help combat the misinformation campaigns used to promote agendas in the mainstream media platforms and help make individuals aware of this effort and make accurate, informed, factual decisions towards otherwise emotionally charged issues. In the words of one of my sources, Ronald Burns, by no means do we mean to intend, I'm sorry, by no means do we intend to diminish the seriousness of school shootings or violence of any kind in any place. Put simply, we argue that social problems should be addressed through a broad assessment of each individual situation, not emotionally charged reactions to isolated incidents. There are my references that I cite. There are photo sources. And at this point, I'd like to take a little extra time just to open up for questions. Thank you, Jake. Who has a question for Jacob? 
Logan, please. All right, Jacob, nice job, man. You look great. Um, yeah, thank you. Good job. Uh, I have one question uh, in regards to a lot of these, a lot of this information, it said like uh, firearm related deaths. Were you able to weed out like the difference between like an actual like homicide versus suicide? Because I know a lot of statistics or inflated statistics out there include suicide with a firearm, which make it looks like like uh, like violence person on person is a whole lot more prevalent than it is. I was wondering what your uh, come across, like what you came across in relationship to that. Sure, and I was aware that that uh, dichotomy existed. Um, that's why I chose the Uniform Crime Report from the FBI as one of my uh, sources for that information. It's just because firearm related deaths and fi firearm related homicides do make that distinction. Just because uh, they the crime report I reference in 2018 was closed firearm related homicides. So that discludes any sort of uh, suicide by firearm or self-inflicted gunshot wound um, or also murder suicide cases. They focus primarily on just homicides, um, not just with mass shootings, but also on the day-to-day -day firearm related homicide. So that's how I drew that distinction. Okay, thank you, nice. Of course. Anything else I can help you guys with? Great question, Logan, and great job, Jacob. Thank you so much. All right, thank you. All right, last but certainly not least, we have Brendan Lindsay. All right. Just let me go ahead and share my screen here. You know what, Brendan, if you don't mind, we just got um, one question directed at Jacob, so as long as we're still here. Yeah, totally. <laughs> Jacob, it says, you mentioned on your contextual information page that about 10,000 homicides were attributed to firearms in 2018. In that same year, what percentage of mass homicides were attributed to AR-15s? Sure. Um, so they actually are roped in because they're technically classified by the FBI as a rifle. Uh, they're actually roped into uh, the rifle category, which was 297 for that year. Um, however, when the FBI does their uniform crime report, they don't identify the individual weapon that was used for the report because a lot of that information is coming from across this, uh, the nation and just based on different reporting uh, criteria from certain law enforcement agencies. Some require the, the model of the firearm used, others don't and just write off it as rifle. Um, so for that particular instance, as far as like an exact number percentage, I can't include, uh, but I do know that those were either included in the 297 uh, cases or even could have been roped over into the 100 and 67, which were due to other firearms, which is anything other than a traditional firearm standard for definition. So but those two categories would also include other rifles and other firearms. So it wouldn't be the total of those two categories that were AR-15, correct? That's correct. Yes. Okay. Thank you for that clarification. Of course. All right. Now in anticipation, turning it over to Brendan. Thank you. All right, let me share my screen here and get it set. 